I'm going to ask on our two illustrious um, speakers here next. We've got Dr. Leslie Standerfer with uh, Buckeye Union. She's Assistant Superintendent of Academics and one of the people that I admire most. And also Jason Stewie, another um, person I admire a lot, is the Assistant Superintendent of Student Achievement at Buckeye Union. These people are edu Jedi. And uh, they've won some big awards from us. So we're super proud of them to share today. And you guys are going to talk about from year zero to hybrid learning, your story. So who's going to share? Which one of you is going to share? Well, can you hear us, Leilani? Yeah, we can hear you. Right. I can't well, hear we're, Leslie we're, yet because she's on mute. We are set up okay. where we're just going to both talk through what's Jason's unmuted. So we don't have to unmute back and forth. Okay. Well, I'm going to be in the background. Do you want to um, have me stay on or are you going to share? Um, Jason's going to share a presentation for us. Okay, good. Good. Well, I'll be lurking in the background to pop on. You know how I am. But, you know, I'm, I'm so happy to hear from you guys today. There we are. All right. I still had Teams on yet, so the video wasn't working because it was with the Teams. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so see if you can share your screen. I will. How's your weather down there? We actually turned a little cold this morning. We've had a couple mornings where it rained in the middle of the night, not during the day, but um, has cooled it off slightly and has given us um, a little bit of cloudy cloudiness, at least in the mornings as we're heading in. So wow. maybe feels a little like winter here. Not yeah. really, but kind of. A bit. Would have been a good golf day, I hear. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good week for golfing. Leilani, I want to confirm I've got the right screen share. Yep, I you. see it. It says from, from year zero to hybrid. I'm excited for you guys awesome. to share this journey. So I'm going to put my camera off, and it's all going to be about you until I come back on. All right. Thank you, Leilani. We're um, honored to be here and be a part of Learning Council. Um, even as Leilani was talking just a few minutes ago, um, it gets us thinking and gets us um, – talking about things we want to do. So we appreciate the opportunity to always be involved. Um, our district has shared part of our story in previous presentations. Our former superintendent who retired last summer, Eric Godfrey, um, has shared both at the regional and at the um, national conference. So if you have been at those, some of what we say um, may sound somewhat familiar, but I think by Jason and I presenting it, it's going to take it with a, a different lens to it. So um, to give you just a little hint of who we are. Here we go. All right. Um, I'm Leslie Standifer. Um, just to share with you the lens that we're kind of presenting our story from, I am in my second year as the assistant superintendent of academics here at district office. But prior to that, I was a principal in the district for 13 years. So part of the journey we're going to go through, I was actually at the building level, and then I came to district office. And Jason Stewie, who's presenting with me, has been here at district office for five years now, um, but was an assistant principal in the district before that, and then teacher, department chair, coach, all of that good stuff um, in this district, as well as um, a couple other districts in his career. Um, but he's worked actually at all three high schools in our district, two of them as a teacher and two of them as an administrator. So, so we're going to start our story. All right, a little background for everyone, just to kind of get a feel for what uh, our um, logistics uh, are in terms of um, location and, and uh, kind of how we organize our people. A little bit of background on several regards. So. Uh, first off, our district currently serves about 4,750 kiddos, um, 9 through 12, so we're a high school only district, uh, located about 35 miles west of downtown Phoenix. Um, our boundaries include two cities that are rapidly growing here in Arizona. We do have a rich agricultural tradition mixed with modern suburbia, so it's an interesting mix that we have in our district that we work with. Uh, Buckeye Union High School, located in the heart of Buckeye, graduated two students in the class of 1921. <laughs> so we're approaching the, uh, we're at the 100-year mark. 
Um, 80 years later, uh, straight up Foothills High School opened the doors uh, in 2001, and then Yonker, our third comprehensive um, in 2011. We also have, I'm sorry, 2007, and the um, Learning Center uh, was in 2011. And we are, uh, one of our schools is busting at the seams right now and looking for potential fixes for that. So just a quick graphic on that growth component. Uh, anybody that's uh, on, the, on this from outside of Arizona, this is what uh, our growth looks like. Buckeyes 56% over that time period and, and good years not far behind that. Um, fastest growing large cities in America. Um, good years right there. And then Buckeye was number two behind Frisco, Texas. So um, growth is something that we're dealing with right now. And, and uh, it's a as Leilani always says, it's a, it's a good problem for us to have because not everywhere is experiencing those things. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we always like to share is, is uh, our land mass for our district. It's uh, quite mind-boggling <laughs> with what we have, but um, Yonker High School sits there in a small footprint. Buckeye Union High School covers a large uh, expanse of land, and then a straight foot is the same. Um, some of those areas are quite um, agricultural and so forth in those larger areas. Um, but just to put that in perspective, that's 50 miles from one end to the other. Uh, about 1,200 square miles is what we um, serve in the district. The irony of that, though, is that Yonker boundary that is the smallest is the high school that's busting at the seams with over 1,900 kids and growing rapidly on us. So much of Buckeye's area is undeveloped at this point. Yeah. So once again, we're a high school only district, which is uh, which is very interesting. I come from Minnesota originally and um, wasn't used to that experience, but um, I, I enjoy having the, the nine through 12 um, problems without having some of the elementary school things that go on. Um, there's advantages, I guess, and disadvantages, I would say. All students and teachers issued a full functioning laptop. And we'll talk about that journey. Uh, the city served Buckeye and Goodyear. Uh, we have four partner elementary only districts, and you can assume that with our growth um, at this time, 15 elementary schools, I know two are, are planned right now and we'll be opening in the next couple of years here, so, and, and it continues to grow. So we'll be adopting those into our uh, high schools here soon. So um, more information on those, those again, um, with what the Learning Center is. What do you want? About the learning center, the learning center um, we have the three comprehensive high schools the learning center is actually a campus that houses several different programs which is why it's called the learning center um, we have our alternative education program that most people think an all fed campus would have um, we do run an lc online which prior to the pandemic was a small number of students but we are an approved um, online provider where students throughout Arizona, if they want an all online high school experience, um, can do our LC online through the Learning Center. But then we also partner with two different um, private day special ed companies that come in. Um, one of the things being that 35 miles from Phoenix is that um, our some of our special populations, such as our emotionally disabled students or some of our most medically fragile students, um, who probably are the ones we want on the bus the least, were sometimes sitting on a bus for an hour or two to get from, especially if they lived in a rural part of our district, to downtown Phoenix to private day schools. And so the concept um, back in 2011 was we will um, take bond money and build the building, and then we'll pay private day companies to come run their programs in our facility, um, which has saved our students having the long um, bus rides that are miserable for anyone, but especially those high need populations, but also allows us to provide that service for districts around us. So the Learning Center is the one exception to that 912. There is actually elementary students who we have intergovernmental agreements with elementary districts and other high school districts around us. And they, instead of busing their kids into downtown Phoenix, bus their kids to our learning center for their private day placements, which allows us to 
offset the cost because we know special education is not fully funded probably anywhere. So our organization structure, just to share with you, um, you know, we're, we're a smaller district and we always feel like we, we think big, um, but thinking big puts a lot on our plates, I guess, in terms of how many hats we wear, because we are still smaller. So we, we get involved with a lot of different things and we kind of pride ourselves in not being real top heavy. Although during this pandemic, it has been a very challenge for us to not be top heavy. Yes, it's uh, it's been hard, but um, so this is just our structure that we set up on the curriculum side of things. We have some of our uh, we, we we got a gear up grant um, for uh, a time period, a substantial amount um, that we brought in this year. That's new uh, with our gear up director. Um, we have a CTE director, career and technical education. Uh, we do have a we're, we're a block scheduled district, so we have uh, eight classes that our students take each year gives us a little more um, elective space, and we do have a strong uh, career technical education program in our district. Um, data director, ESS director, and an IT director. That data director, just to clarify a little bit, that is not really an achievement data. That is really the person who manages our student management system um, and does our enrollment uploads to the state, that kind of state reporting and managing, yeah. So that is not actually student ach achievement data. That, that is part of Jason's role. Um, EL, EL and literacy coordinator that we've, we've been able to add in the few, few past years. Um, obviously the principals at each of our comprehensive campuses are breakdown with our admin teams. We have an academic uh, operations and a discipline person. Um, we have a student achievement teacher uh, who works with me on each campus, um, and then an instructional specialist, uh, counselors and gear up coaches, uh, then our department chairs uh, for our departments. Um, we have curriculum coordinators. One of those department chairs serves as a curriculum coordinator, and, and we're working to have them become more and more involved at the district level. Um, but as we transition from a small to a maybe medium size, um, so that's how we're transitioning um, department chairs into curriculum type direct or curriculum coordinators at a district level. Um, collaborative team leaders, our larger departments have collaborative team leaders for each of their subjects, Algebra 1 or English 1 and so forth, and then our team members and our parapros that work with them. And then Leslie talked about our details on our learning center and our, we have a principal and then our learning center teams. When you look at that organization chart, because we said we're not top heavy, and then you see all of those support positions, um, outside of the directors and principals and assistant principals, those student achievement teachers, those instructional specialists, the curriculum coordinators, even our EL and literacy coordinator, and of course all the department chairs and CTLs, those are all teachers who take this on in addition a few of those key people have a release time section or two, but um, they're doing these roles in addition to their full-time job as a teacher. Yes. So, all right. So our journey of getting connected. If you go back 10 years, um, we were your typical district, which I know a lot of Arizona districts um, and districts in our region are still at that point where you don't have the funding to have every student with their own laptop. And that's been a challenge here during the pandemic. So 10 years ago, we were still computer labs on campus that you were, um, you know, scheduling around other teachers to get into. Um, before we got LCD projectors in our classrooms, departments had laptop carts where they could get a, um, a laptop connected to an LCD projector. But again, they were scheduling around other teachers for that. And as far as electronic devices, these things were seen or heard, it was taken away. So um, at one point, we weren't embracing technology as much as we wanted to. Um, but then we moved into, um, we added the LCD projectors and to classrooms, and that, took, that was over a period of time. Um, but we went to bring your own device. And for a few years, um, we did say, okay, as long as you're using this device for um, 
educational purposes, you can have it on at school. And so we had teachers start using Edmodo or Schoolology and um, put notes up for kids and kids could use their devices maybe to do like a Quizlet type thing or something. Um, as a principal at that time, I can tell you that the number one complaint I had from parents was now I have to pay for a data pack on my kid's cell phone or my kid is left out of some of the activities teachers are doing in class. And we had to work with teachers to say, hey, you can't tell a kid hand their expensive electronic device to a neighbor. Now there's some responsibility on us of how that's being treated. Um, so then we moved into, in our fourth year of BYOD, we had actually passed a bond where we were gonna buy laptops and go one-to-one. -one. And bond money is how, the, how we have afforded our one-to-one -one initiative. So in the 14-15 school year, we gave teachers laptops. So a year before um, students had them, teachers and students having a desktop computer that ties you to your desk, we gave our teachers laptops and they were yoga laptops. So they could walk around the classroom with them and um, be more interactive and they connected to their LCD projectors and all of that stuff. In that year, we brought in our first company of outside consultants and from the principal level, I'll tell you, um, I think the mistake we made there being new to one-to-one, um, -to -one, so if someone's at that stage that they're gonna go into that, I think one of the um, mistakes we made is we really didn't have a focus to the PD. The outside consultants came in and they were teaching teachers how to use features of their laptop, but I don't know that they were really teaching teachers how to use the laptop for instruction. And um, they were teaching teachers how to show kids how to use a laptop and then teachers went in their classroom and kids didn't have a lot laptop yet. So that first outside consultant group was not the most successful for us. So the next year, um, we brought in a different um, outside consultant. And actually, um, the first that first go around, we had purchased Dell laptops, and we had some Dell credits, education credits that helped us to afford um, maybe some higher price consultants. But um, the consultants helped us go in with a year zero mentality. And so instead of going in and saying, okay, every teacher, regardless of your comfort level with technology, here's what you expect, we expect you to do with these laptops. We said, you know what, teachers, you have the discretion of when to tell your students it's appropriate to have their laptop and use it, and when you want them maybe to put their lid down and um, participate in an activity that's not on the laptop. And we had what we call our trailblazer teachers. And these were those teachers who were gung-ho and excited um, and were ready to use that technology. And we introduced the SAMR model, which I'll explain in a minute, where we looked at, okay, we started talking about what are we doing with this technology and why do we have it? And then from there, the next year, our trailblazers really led our in-services. So instead of putting consultants in front of our teachers, um, we had trailblazers. Now the consultants helped guide our, our trailblazers in what in-servicing they wanted to do. And they introduced a tip chart, which started to look at um, a detailed look at what are teacher behaviors and student behaviors with those laptops. The SAMR model, for those of you who may not have seen this before, is just looking at how technology is used. So at the enhancement level, is it just a substitution? Is it a fancy um, worksheet? Are we getting to the point where we're augmenting so there's some functional improvement? Maybe kids, as soon as they finish their homework at home at night, can upload it um, to the teacher, to a teacher inbox versus having to remember to bring the paper the next day to school. So then how do we get to that transformation level, which is the things that Leilani talks about, where we start to modify tasks and we actually redefine what learning looks like. So as we continued in our um, get connected and we were in year three, we started to change our focus from how to use technology and not just showing teachers apps and what are you gonna do with the technology, but really talking about what is it we want our students to gain in high school and how do we use technology to help them. 
Um, and Jason's going to go into a, a little more detail on this. But we started with kind of trying to develop the portrait of a graduate. And then we came up with a future ready learner profile that Jason's going to show you. And then out of that learner profile, we actually brought in community members and did reflective walks in the 1920 school year where we started to actually go in classrooms with different stakeholders, look at how technology was being used, but more specifically how learning was taking place and what impl implications and how could that help us plan through our AIM High program? How could that help us plan both um, interventions for students and enhancements for students. So the future ready um, process that we do, we just wanted to share a little bit with you on what that looked like. Um, we had a partnership with advanced learning partners um, that helped us go through this journey of developing what future ready for Buckeye Union High School District look like. Um, so we put together, this was the panel that started it off, uh, a, a large group of people, both, both Leslie and I are on there, um, slightly different roles back then. Um, but to just point out, uh, we really made a big deal about this future ready in our community. So we, we had community input, uh, we had community college, our West Mech, our local business owners, corporate leaders, think tank leaders, judges, city leaders, all those people that are listed there. Um, that's what it looked like when we brought all those people in to talk about what future ready looked like. We really started with a blank sheet of paper and started talking about what it could look like and what we wanted our graduates to, you know, to look like when they were going to leave us and get out into the, their next step in, the, in life. Um, this is what we came up with and created. Um, the input from this came from just, you know, I, I highlighted community there, but we had parent, parent involvement, students, admin teams, teachers, and support staff um, all go through that process and give their input on, on what this would look like. It was really pretty cool to see um, the students talk about this from their perspective. I actually point out to you guys this, this, this uh, logo that's up here in the, that I'm circling right now, that was actually a design drawn on the whiteboard in uh, marker. And uh, we, we did a few enhancements there. We added in a little Buckeye flavor and stuff because the, the gal that did it had all the, these uh, buildings built up here, but we added in a little Buckeye and stuff. We got our stamp of approval for that, but uh, it was a pretty cool process to, to hear kids talk about what they thought they needed to have when they left our schools and, and so forth. So it was a pretty cool experience we wanted to share with you that uh, we did, and, and those are the pillars. I won't read through all of it, but just gives you an idea of what we went through to arrive on that. So with our focus on learning, we had good momentum going and we were excited about where we were going. And then as we all know, the pandemic hit last year um, and school closures. And now that technology journey that we were on um, really got tested of where were we and how far along on that journey were we. So last year, spring break, we went on spring break. Things had been normal up to that point. Um, and then while we were on spring break, some of the schools in Arizona who were on a different schedule than us started closing schools. And I remember Jason and I actually being in this same conference room that we're in right now, um, listening to a health department um, webinar where they said numbers are still low and we don't recommend closing schools yet, that um, we don't know when COVID numbers will ever be this low. We're entering a pandemic. And so we ended spring break on Thursday afternoon, sending our teachers and staff an email saying, yes, we really are coming back on Monday. And Friday we sent it to our parents. And um, as we sent it out and as our elementary Schools sent out that, yes, we're all coming back from spring break. Um, you started to have all of the backlash in the community, not only our community, but across the state of schools need to be closed. And by the Sunday that ended our spring break, the governor had um, declared schools in Arizona closed. Um, and so those of you who are listening, attending from Arizona, um, you'll remember that. And, and schools were closed. And... So most of us, our governing board met and basically did a extend spring break 
by a week or two until we figure out what the government governor is really telling us. And so um, we basically sent out another email to our community and staff and stuff saying we were extending spring break for students, but we let our staff know, and especially that leadership structure that you saw, know that we were going to go into planning meetings and figure out um, what this closure meant. And so through meeting with our admin cabinet, our curriculum coordinators, and our um, Excellence in Education Council, which is all those directors and department heads and curriculum coordinators that you saw, we came up with our plan of what we were gonna do after spring break. Now, initially, we truly thought the closure was going to be just for a few weeks. And so we started with stage zero and we said, you know what, we've had kids on an extended spring break. We just need to reconnect with our kids. We need to engage them in something, make sure they can connect. Um, we started quickly getting hotspots um, our first attempt at that was we do have buses that have Khajiits that provide um, internet access. And so we took key points throughout our community. Remember, we're that huge um, landmass. But we took some spots far in the district and um, spots that we knew that connectivity was an issue. And we parked buses with Khajiits. And that worked for students to be able to go and you know, send a quick um, message to their teachers to connect and let them know they were um, alive and well. And it worked for kids to go download an assignment, work on it asynchronous, and then upload it again in some cases. Um, that didn't work in all cases, though. And that's when we started um, working with cell phone companies of who could get us hotspots. Um, and we, to this day, still have families in our community that are, the kids are using hotspots that we're providing and the district is um, paying the bill on. So we spent a week connecting and engaging. And then our next week, our stage, and we use that same stage zero. There was really no expectation other than to connect and engage. Stage one was review and strengthen. And this was actually done again when we thought that the closure was gonna be um, temporary. And so we thought by some point in April, we're gonna be back in school in person. So rather than trying to do a lot of new learning, let's just review and strengthen the skills that we have so that when our kids come back, we can hit the ground running. Um, and then in April, our governor came out and announced that schools were closed for the remainder of the year. When he did that, he also though put some interesting caveats that affected that stage two and new learning. Um, one of those caveats was that a student's grade could not go down because of the closure. So even though we didn't choose to announce it, clearly to our families, what that meant was their grade couldn't be any lower than that third quarter grade. And our local news media did let families know that. So in that new learning, we did struggle to have kids um, connect in that phase. We did a lot of asynchronous learning, teachers maybe video lessons, those kinds of things um, to let people know what was, you know, coming in those and, and to provide that instruction to students. Um, but other than our dual enrollment and AP students who were preparing for test, the motivation was more intrinsic on students because they knew their grade couldn't go down. But what that stage two and new learning did give us was an opportunity to kind of test run and figure out where we were with our technology use. Um, and I will tell you, when we hit that connect and engage stage, um, we had teachers who the minute we sent out an email to families saying your kid's teacher will be online, the students knew exactly where to go because their teacher already had a team set up and the kids um, could sign in and get the information from their teachers immediately. And we had other teachers that had to literally go in our email system and email their students, go into your team's app and here's how you find me. Um, so that at least prepared us for this year in that we weren't gonna let any of our teachers not have platforms set up. And so the teachers who had maybe complacency had set in or they had, um, 
stopped the experimenting with technology, quickly got woke up and as we went into this school year. So this year we've had a variety of learning modalities. Um, from the beginning, we knew that we were gonna have some families that wanted a full online learning experience. They wanted the flexibility that truly an online charter um, program offers where 24 seven the student has access and they work at their own pace. So our LC online that had maybe been 40 or 50 students in the past um, immediately grew to over 400 students. Um, and so where we had not spent a lot of time on curriculum alignment, we use Edgenuity for that, where we had not spent a lot of time on curriculum alignment, um, we again went to that leadership team. I don't think they felt like they had a summer. Be between curriculum writing and us working with them, getting the new year set up, um, but they helped us to do some alignment on those courses. And so our full online learning exists. Our governor had announced, and we were on a schedule where we were to start school around August 3rd or 4th. Our governor announced that no school could physically start prior to August 17th. But if you had a way to do distance learning, you could start school on your regular calendar. And so we started all of our students in distance learning. Our state strongly encouraged synchronous learning. Um, so we actually developed a bell schedule that we originally used for distance learning where we got our teachers on synchronous. We worked with our teachers um, and this had been a continuous process from their experimenting in the spring as we close to how do you balance that time of students just sitting in front of a computer to sit and get to letting them work on assignments and projects and how do they um, interact with colleagues, et cetera. So we started the year on distance learning. Um, the governor in Arizona had the health department develop health, health benchmarks that very much align with the CDC um, recommendations. So we actually ended up following those health recommendations, staying in distance learning for the, fourth, for the full first quarter of the school year. Um, but as we returned from our fall break, we were in a, um, as far as our health benchmarks, they were recommending hybrid learning. So we restructured our bell schedule, um, some to allow for transportation and buses to bring kids in but also to balance what does it look like when you have students moving from class to class and you're trying to keep social distancing and some of the things that we were trying to keep. And so we did a hybrid schedule where half of our students, now those students who had chose full online, online the asynchronous, they're not included in here. They're, they stayed full online. But of those students who had been distance learning, we gave them, we split them in half on each campus and half of the students would come on Monday, thir Thursday, half of the students would come on Tuesday, Friday, and all of the students then would distance learn on Wednesday. What we found is even though the health benchmark said it was safe, we had a mix of how safe families felt it was. And so we did not have near the numbers um, that we expected online. And we had that struggle that teachers were teaching students in front of them, as well as um, students online. And the first reaction of teachers was to sit in front of the computer and just make it everyone sign into Teams. And, and that didn't give that classroom feel. So as we've went into second semester with some of that feedback from teachers and from our community and parents about how students felt about learning, our governing board has voted that we are going to return to um, in-person learning on February 8th. So this in-person distance combo, we are not in yet. We're preparing our teachers and going into it um, February 8th. Again, those parents who chose the full online learning, their students are still asynchronous, but those students who are in the distance learning where they're following a bell schedule with our teachers on campus. Now we're gonna choose either come to school five days a week or stay distant. So we know we will have a segment of the population that while the teachers are teaching in the classroom with in-person students, 
we're going to have a segment of students online. And so um, upcoming here in a couple in services, we're going to have teachers who during the hybrid stage figured out that balance of what's the best techniques to engage the kids in the room, but not ignore the kids online. They're going to be sharing those um, techniques to help all of our teachers. So what were our struggles through this? Because we definitely had struggles. Um, our first struggle was connectivity. And that was back from that very first um, week of connect and engage through is um, we are a mix of suburban and rural. And so um, our students in the suburban areas um, have better likelihood to have connectivity at home. Some of our students in the rural areas our hot spots. we had originally went with one cell company for those. We found some areas that that cell company didn't work, but a different cell company did. And so we got new hot spots and took them to those families. And we still have some students who struggle from home. And this whole time that we've been distance learning this school year, we have had what is called in Arizona on-site support open. And we have students who come to our on-site support even though schools aren't technically open, where they're sitting on campus um, getting their connectivity during the school day on our campuses. Those teacher tech skills, um, even though we were four or five years into our one-to-one -one initiative at the point these closures happened, we still had teachers with various varying tech skills. And so if I was a teacher who was very comfortable using technology, I had a very clear platform set up, my students signed into Teams, they knew where to get their assignments. If I was a teacher who wasn't as comfortable, I provided some resources, gave kids chances to, you know, type their assignments, but I didn't really have a clear platform and wasn't doing as good a job with all of the aspects of technology. I was still at that substitution level. And so um, it has been great to watch our teachers um, work together and share ideas and our more tech savvy teachers um, take other colleagues under their wing and show them how to use um, technology through this. We also have student engagement and I would tell you this is a continuing challenge and our biggest challenge is how do you engage students online? Um, because obviously they're sitting at home and we don't have the same control over them um, that we generally have. And if we truly had the answer to this, Jason and I, instead of presenting at Learning Council, would be out selling this across the country. Um, but we'll share a little bit of what we've learned in that on the next slide. Um, we also have the struggle of monitoring student performance and checking for understanding. For several years, um, we've had a consultant that works with us on instruction who tells our teachers, I don't want to hear your answer is you see it in their eyes. That is not a true check for understanding. Um, and even though we've made that a focus of quite a bit of our PD is how do you really teach to an objective and check that students understand it. Um, we still found that some of those checks for understanding were body language in the classroom to see it in their eyes. And so our teachers really had to look for other ways to check for understanding. The hybrid combination, the teaching multiple modalities, I've already touched upon a little bit, but um, our teachers are gonna continue to have that challenge of, they're gonna teach students that are in front of them, but there is gonna be, while this pandemic's in place, students who are at home. Um, and then our final big challenge we identified was that lack of hands-on opportunities for students who are distance learning. And so our district has always had a strong um, commitment to our career and technical education. Um, we have our fine and performing arts and those teachers um, are getting very creative on how do we actually get those hands-on opportunities and even science classrooms. If, if I don't have the students here to dissect a frog, how do I do that online? And in science, you probably have some better online tutorials than you do in those CTE areas. Sometimes if you're gonna to learn to weld, you just have to weld. Um, but some lessons learned through this. 
some of our short-term lessons we've learned um, is that technology is valuable. So some of our teachers who were using our technology in limited capacities have started to use um, Nearpod and Quizlet and different things to do those checks for understanding and um, have found that technology really does help students organize and can be very valuable to them. We've also learned that you have to be overt with expectations for students. Um, most of us were trained in Harry Wong and you teach procedures in your classroom the first few days of the semester, but we didn't necessarily be as overt about teaching, teaching expectations of what's online behavior and what does engagement look like from home. And we've learned that the better, the more overt teachers have been at putting out those expectations, the more student engagement they have. 100% those overt checks for understanding of using some of the technology tools that truly let you see the answer from 100% of your students than just the ones who give you the most um, overt eye contact or that kind of thing in the classroom. We've had improved communication district-wide. Um, we've had a strong PLC structure in our district for years where we have late starts every Wednesday and campuses and um, department teams work together and quarterly we have district PLCs and then we have a couple learning conference days, one each semester. And so we've done a lot of our district-wide collaboration on those quarterly PLC days and those learning conference days when we can have everyone together. Well, to do those days, we had to look at virtual formats and our departments across the board have had to look at um, how do we communicate with everyone not in person? And what we're seeing is people are now willing to say, hey, let's just jump on a Teams call and have a meeting. And so we definitely have improved communication because people aren't trying to find a date and time they can drive to be together. Um, because between our campuses, you have about a half an hour drive between Estrella Foothills and the other campuses in the district. We've also had to do better prioritization of our standards. When we're teaching online, kids have learned at a different pace. Um, some of that's probably we're not, we haven't been the most perfect at teaching. And so um, as we've been figuring out those checks for understanding and how to impart instruction, we haven't covered as much. But I think in the end, we've prioritized our standards and really determined what is it that we teach is important? And what is it is those fluff, um, elementary, they joke about the dinosaur units and things. High school has those equivalents. And um, we've, I think, prioritized our standards and taken some of that fluff out that maybe was what we like, but not part of the standards of what students needed to know. We also, in the short term, we're seeing that teachers can teach from home. And we have some teachers, even when we went in hybrid, that had some medical conditions where they weren't safe coming back. And rather than, as we talked to other districts across the state and heard how many teachers were going on FMLA leave or how many teachers were resigning, we wanted an alternative to that. And so we have allowed um, teachers with the proper medical documentation to actually teach from home and when we were in hybrid mode and when we go back in person, um, we do have to put a sub physically in the classroom with students. Um, but we've chosen rather than having a sub physically in the classroom, teaching a content area they're not qualified to teach without the pedagogy knowledge that teachers have, let's let our teacher teach from home. And one of our teachers, when I was um, asking as we were preparing for this, um, some of the things that she saw moving forward, um, th that ability to teach from home, that maybe I'm sick and contagious and can't come to class, but if you put a sub in my room and I send my kids to teens, I can still teach versus losing a day of instruction or having kids do busy work. And with that same, that same response also garnered that we can record lessons and make them available to students later. So if students are absent and we've recorded our lesson, we can have it available to students. 
through this whole thing, our interim superintendent, Mr. Robertson, has stressed to teachers flexibility and that understanding for what students are going through as they're having to learn from home, as they maybe have to take care of siblings, as they maybe um, don't have a quiet learning environment. And as our teachers have actually had a glimpse into homes, um, because as kids on mute, you hear what's going on maybe in the background and those kinds of things. I think there's some understanding for what our students' lives look like outside of um, the walls of our school. And, and I think there's some valuable relationships being built between teachers and students as teachers have realized that. And then finally here on lessons learned, I think one of the big lessons has been to take risks and learn new things. Um, sometimes as teachers and adults, we get in our comfort zone and we do what we know we can do well in front of kids and this whole closure. And so I don't just use technology when I'm comfortable using it and it fits my activity, but I have to use it every day, has had our teachers taking risks and learning new things that I think they'll keep with them um, for the long term. And then finally, moving forward, um, one of the things that we have so much appreciated about Learning Council, and um, as we listen to Leilani and she talks about what the future of education looks like, we get excited and we start to say, how can we do that? Um, and so moving forward, I think that probably the closure has moved us at least a decade forward in being willing to look at how we do learning and these choice of modalities. I think some of our teachers who, I think our teachers, not only are we gonna have students and parents moving forward saying, okay, what learning style is my kid and did the online work better for my kid because we have some students who have social anxiety issues that are flourishing in this online environment because they don't have the pressure of school so the online is working for those students but i think we're even in within our classrooms i think teachers are going to make a more concerted and educated choice on okay for this particular concept and this particular um, lesson, an online 3D lab is gonna be better than a wet lab. In this other situation, the wet lab's really gonna meet my goal. So I think you're gonna have choice of modalities, um, both in the structure of the school day and in um, individual classrooms and choices teachers make. Um, Leilani, in that game that she referenced in the session before our session um, talked about having flexibility where students don't all have to be doing the same thing at the same time. And our district prior to the pandemic um, was looking at um, and had started some partnerships both with Westmec, a technological district near us, and our community college where we were going to give our students flexibility of how do we build not only dual enrollment courses in your schedule at campus, but if you want to go to a college campus, how do we do a schedule for you where you're with us part day, you're at the college part day, you're at our Westmec doing technological, um, a pharmacy program or a haircutting program or a vet tech program part of the day and with us part of the day. And how do we take those barriers of transportation? Because Westmec's been a, available to our students for a decade or more, but some of our students didn't have the transportation to get there. And so we had worked out a plan where our district was going to be able to transport. And we even had worked out where they were going to offer morning sessions that we're going to give our district students more slots because most districts weren't working with Westmec to do it. And so um, we think that this, where um, maybe counselors, parents, staff, students, struggled understanding what we were trying to do with that flexibility. I think this has helped them see those possibilities and we're gonna have more students jump on board and wanna do those because of this closure. And then the big thing that I think we've seen here um, that I'll give as kind of a closing thought to this is that our biggest lesson has been the role of the teacher. I think as online learning and 
um, different educational software comes forward and stuff. I think one of the fears probably in teachers' minds for the last couple decades has been, is computers going to replace the teacher? And I think what we've seen and what um, Leilani definitely talks about is not that the computer is going to replace the teacher, the computer is going to free up the teacher from some housekeeping roles and from some other mundane tasks to really be able to key in and give students individualized attention because some of the <coughs> mass instruction can be done with technology, especially when you get into some of your adaptive software. And then the teacher can really focus in and intervene and enrich. And so I think um, across the board, we have seen how important that te those teachers are. And I think the pandemic has maybe raised appreciation for teachers um, that will hopefully help us as we move forward, continue education and make things better. So that is our presentation as we have it. Um, if there's questions, comments, we're. Hey, yeah, so we're back. So um, I think uh, Doug is gonna help me run chat. I'm gonna ask everybody that's still on the line right now to, to make sure you pop in in the Q and A and uh, make some comments, ask some questions. We're gonna be talking about motivation next. Um, but I just wanna say, you know, I'm super proud of you guys, uh, Leslie and Jason. and and really how far you've come, you know? I know this year was rough. <laughs> um, it was rough for everyone. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, you, you started out with a really solid uh, ground. And now you're all the way to talking about your own flexibility. And I think that that's, that's going to continue. I think it has to. You know, I think it's true. Normal's not really coming back. And a, <laughs> a, uh, a flip in structure is real. Um, driving more at true personalization is really real. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. I think what I want to really ask you guys is kind of um, what happened on the staffing side? You know, you had to drag maybe some people kicking and screaming. Can you, you sort of talk about that a little bit, each of you? Like, I don't, I know you're not going to name names, but you know, <laughs> There was probably some fights and some. I have them in the back of our mind as we explain it to you. Yes. Um, fortunately, honestly, with our staffing, as we've heard horror stories from colleagues in other districts of how many teachers have resigned or left the district, or how many teachers have went on FMLA leave and their sub shortage and that kind of thing, we have not experienced that. Okay. Um, part of that is, I believe, because our teachers. Um, even the ones who resisted technology had some familiarity with it. And then I will praise our high flyer teachers. Those rock stars really jumped in and helped their colleagues and said, you know, this really isn't hard. Here's what you do in your classroom. Here's how we can help you do it online. Mm -hmm. And so that has been awesome <coughs> in that we haven't dealt with the losing staffing. Um, but in some of our modalities, when we talk about the LC online, where it grew from 40 to over 400 students overnight, um, we have had to look at our staff and really consider who our rock stars are that are willing to jump in and do more. And um, just like we buy preps back when we're short teachers um, in a regular classroom scenario, um, we bought preps back for teachers to support those online students and actually um, be available to help those students. And, and that was a process because those were teachers who are used to controlling the instruction their kids get and the pacing their kids get. And now they had to take a different role of, I'm going to check in on students and I'm going to um, offer to tutor students one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, but it's not going to be at this set. You're going to be in my classroom at this time and tutorings only at this time and stuff. Um, but I really would praise our staff for one, sticking with us and um, staying through it and not resigning and not running for the hills. Um, 
but also working together in teams and figuring out how to use things. And, um, and we did, you know, our, our back to school, we did it completely virtual. We didn't bring anyone to campus for it. And we did our learning conference completely virtual. And I think our teachers have gotten where they, they're setting up their own kind of virtual meetings where they're sharing and someone shares a screen and walks colleagues through, hey, I did this online with this app and it worked great. And here's how you can do it and helping each other. So that's awesome. Yeah. So the, the structure that we've set up in that uh, the, the beginning, that one slide that gives up our uh, organizational structure, mm -hmm. those professional learning community models that we have uh, built in there. Um, I've got a slide in our slide deck that kind of explains, you know, our meeting structure and how we really work from um, our teachers on up that disseminate the information. But those champions that we had who, who had harnessed that technology, um, through those meeting structures we had established, that really helped us to spread that to the people. And the, those ones that you maybe talked about at the beginning, and we did have a couple at the beginning that were like, they're, they're, they were he they already were in the retirement mode already. <laughs> and, and they're like, you know what, I think this is enough of this. I'm mm -hmm. not doing this online thing. And then all of a sudden they got into it and they got a little support and they were like, Hey, this, this actually can work, you know? And, um, but it took a lot of, uh, you know, support and, and understanding, I guess, to help those people get there. So um, that just to add to that, that uh, uh, line there, that's, that's what we experienced, but that professional learning community and the structure that we have, the, the Wednesdays that we have off, we have quarterly PLCs. So four times during the year, we, we take half the day and we go and, and meet as district teams. Um, so they got time to collaborate. Um, a lot of times we're talking about data and, and how we're doing, but this turned into be, you know what, this is where we're going to go to help because the data right now isn't as important as making sure we're all talking about how to do this online environment and, and distance learning thing. So um, that all helped us do that. We, we have a couple of new uh, people that in our admin ranks that are new to our district this year. Um, them coming in, one of the comments they said is it's, it's remarkable how nimble you guys are because of that structure that you have set up that allows you to, to, to change. I mean, the number of staff, we're, we're not huge, of course, but for us, it's it, we were able to move things and change things pretty quickly and have buy-in and people on board to do it. So um, mm -hmm. that's yes, for sure. And even when we closed last spring, within just a few days, we had went through the structure and done our levels of meetings, and we had come up with learning um, parameters with expectations for, for students and teachers. And through our different modalities, we have revised those parameters and changed them and, and stuff. But that structure has really allowed us to do that where we had buy-in into those parameters. So it wasn't just um, something that Jason or, and or Leslie went in an office and wrote and handed down to teachers. Our That's teachers good. really collaboratively wrote them with us. And yeah, so you guys are already talking about where I'm going to go. Well, I'll give you a sneak peek. In 2022, you'll see Learning Council talking more about the golden age of administration and the structure of the administration itself. So be prepared to be highlighted again. But we do have a question right now um, from uh, Janine Evanson. If she can be unmuted, please. I know Doug's on the line. If, if uh, Janine, I'm going to have you... Uh, Ask your question directly, please, live. Are you there? Seeing if she's there. I don't know if I need to unmute her myself. Let's see. Yeah, I'm sorry. Actually, oh. this is uh, Sean Evenson. Actually, I when oh. I auto-filled, my uh, wife's name popped up, so I do apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, my question is, can you share more about uh, your thoughts on the role of the teacher and what does instruction really look like in your setting in those content areas, not just DLA, but maybe science and social studies, especially with your new models? The instruction, I will tell you the area the teachers have struggled the most is that when they're distance learning, they're good. When they have students in front of them, they're good. It's trying to mix. How do I do both at once? And that's a piece that, like I said, we're going to continue to work with them um, at upcoming PLCs, but it's really, um, 
one of the one of the things that we had to say to them when we first went into this, um, because they were in front of a computer screen on Teams, they automatically kind of resorted back to direct instruction. That okay, I have to every minute of the class time I have with them, I have to be directing and sharing a screen and going through, you know, a PowerPoint or whatever. Um, and so what we had to explain to them is go back to what your classroom looked like in person when you put kids in groups, when you gave students time to work on things and you monitored and stuff. How do you do that in an online environment? So let your kids go out of teams if they need to because of um, broadband width limitations and go to Math Excel and work on problems and then be available to answer their questions and monitor what they're doing in Math Excel as they do that. Let your kids go, you know, collaborate and discuss and work on things. Now, I will tell you one of the challenges we've had through this whole thing was working with our IT department on what controls were set. Because initially we found that chat had been turned off on teams on students. So they couldn't use the chat feature and they were, you know, emailing questions if they were too shy to unmute and ask them to teachers. And so we had to go to IT and say, I know you have some security um, concerns with this, but unmute chat. We kids have to be able to use the features of the technology. Um, we did also have to up some of the security on Teams to make sure that it was only our internal people getting into our classrooms and things like that. So that was part of it. But we've worked with teachers and and really tried to have them say, would you ever structure a class in person? fully direct instruction, no. So how do you take the same kind of activities and changing up your class period and how do you do that online? Just like in your classroom, you tell students you're gonna go work on this for 10 minutes and then we're gonna come back together. You gotta let them walk away from the computer, think about things, work on things with a time that they're coming back and, and that kind of thing and the focus that we're gonna work on in our next in-service is while you have students at home and you have students in front of you, how do you make the kids in front of you feel like they're in a class where you really are looking at them and teaching to them, but also um, include the kids online. And the kids online doesn't mean that you as a teacher <coughs> have to be monitoring the chat every second. How about you have some of your classmates paired up with a kid who's at home? And if the kid puts a question in chat, the classmate asks the question for them versus um, sending everyone, you know, to team, you know, teams and the teacher just sitting in front of the computer. So does that help answer it some? <laughs> Yes, thank you so very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, great.